Well, good morning, and thank you for that introduction. Um, we're going to talk about cars today, and we're going to talk about cars in the context of how disruptive the future of mobility is going to be on you all as members of this vast industry known as the insurance industry. Now, I really appreciate the opportunity to come and share this information with you. And to that degree, let's just dive right in. So how does somebody from the Midwest get into car tech after all these years in the insurance industry? And it probably goes back to when I was very young. Now, some of you may remember back in the day, junior associates and law firms were called upon to go out and actually adjust claims. And when I was very young, my father got such a phone call. I was three or four, five years old. Pouring, and it was like two, three in the morning. And for reasons I'll never understand, and he doesn't even, uh, he couldn't begin to explain the day. He hauled me out of bed, put me in the front seat of our Ford Fairlane station wagon. It was a uh, sky blue. And we went out to an accident scene. Now, in this particular scene, um, we had, it was pouring, there was water running down the windshield, and I remember driving by all the flashing lights, and we were up in the park next to the cab of the semi-truck. Now what had happened on that night was the two semis had unfortunately uh, been involved in a head-on collision. And I remember he pulled up and parked close to one of the trucks because he wanted to try to stay reasonably dry, trying to get some photographs. And I looked over and the legs were still in this truck. The uh, dashboard had been pinned against the back seat. And I remember that leaving, I didn't, it didn't really register on me what I was looking at at the time. And I'm sure he would not have taken me out there at that impressionable age. Um, but he was a good attorney and junior, a junior associate in a small firm in the Midwest and wanted to make a good impression. And so, of course, his mind was on getting the job done. Well, fast forward through 25 years of then working in the insurance industry, and much of that time was unfortunately spent helping families uh, put their lives back together again and recover from unimaginable losses often related to cars. Now, I had a real watershed moment in 2009. Some of you may have heard me describe this in the past, and I'll tell you more about that uh, later in the presentation. Now, so with that background, let's jump in. There's a lot of buzz and hype. There's a few doubts, a lot of confusion when it comes to autonomy and vehicles. And what I want to leave you with are three important questions answered by three realities. And hopefully what we're going to do is break up some myths. First, we have to step back and realize this is a very complex issue, and you can't look at just one trend and hope to understand the pace and momentum with which all of this is happening. So let's, in the interest of stepping back first, let's deal with a very important question. What does it take for any exponential technology to go viral, to essentially take off? And you have to have an alignment of three constituencies. Now this is true whether we're looking at Facebook or digital cameras, any disruptive technology that has transplanted or transformed an industry in the past and will in the future. First and foremost, you have to have a consumer job to be done. A large scale consumer base with a pain point or problem to be solved. Next, you have to have the technology for that solution. Now, in vehicle tech and in computational capabilities, so computers, you'll see here this rather bold claim that we've been operating at about two and a half times Moore's Law since 2010. 
So Moore's Law having to do with the growth in capability and the collapse in cost that's simultaneous. Next, once you have your solution, and it does in fact solve that consumer need, you have to have the business acumen or business structure to take that to market. When all three of those align, then you have the sweet spot for innovation or a viral explosion of some sort of adoption. The irony for the insurance industry is that it played a central role in this alignment of constituencies in transportation back in the day. What do I mean? The last great transformation in technology and transportation mobility was at the turn of the century. We had mass urbanization, and so you had this huge migration into American cities. You had the invention of a new technology, which I would submit to you was not the car, but the mass assembly line. Now, you had a mass assembly line to produce an affordable vehicle. You had a consumer need, which was to move from point A to point B in cities. But you had to have the business acumen, and this is where the insurance industry played a role. So there were two business skill sets that essentially came into their own at this time. The advent of consumer credit and the invention or advent of auto insurance. The net result was, of course, that the car went viral. And things have kind of been a mess ever since. Which leads us to question number one of the three that I mentioned and a reality. We now have the technological capability to ask and answer a question we've never been able to ask and answer before. We could answer it, we just couldn't build it. Now we can build it. Now we can build it affordably. What do we want from our mobility systems? And I say what do we want from mobility, not cars. But think about it. What do we want from our transportation that we haven't had before? or that we don't have now. Because I will tell you, as long as we're not talking about teleportation, the answer is, we can do that. Do we want the cars to see farther than we can? We can do that. Do we want to see through fog and dark? Now, I apologize for this being a busy slide, but you'll notice that every single item on the checklist, be it silly or fanciful, has a check mark by it. And that's because somebody has already built it. Once you use technology like autonomy to eliminate a certain percentage of crashes, and you'll note I said a certain percentage, it's never 100%, correct? Can we agree on that? If we're going to insist on 100%, 100% of anything, reliability, safety, 100% effectiveness, 100% viability in all weather conditions at all time, then let's stop now, because that's a non-start. The basic wheel doesn't work that effectively. However, we can use these technologies to eliminate 80, 85, 90% of all crashes. Now that's significant for a couple of reasons. And we hear these statistics all the time, but it's kind of hard to get our heads wrapped around it, so let me give you these statistics in different terms. We essentially repeated the fatality count of World War II twice since the end of World War II. We've just done it in our cars. Cars are the leading killer of young adults more than all forms of cancer combined. With these technologies, it's a watershed because if we can eliminate 80 to 85, 90, 95% of those fatalities, 90, 95% of all crashes, it's a watershed. It's a watershed for vehicle design, for different uh, materials, for electrification, for the elimination of range anxiety, and a whole plethora, if you will, of other societal benefits. To simplify this, think about it this way. Take your phone, put four wheels on it, make it bigger. The car is the next great 
mobile device. Things like autonomy and safety are simply apps that get layered up. Now I talked about Moore's Law and the fact that we're running at about two and a half times Moore's Law since 2010. Here's an example. What you see in front of you is the trunk of a fully autonomous Prius from 2012. And no, this is not a Google car. This was actually um, at grid speed in Zurich, but you get the idea. Now, there's very little that's appealing from a consumer perspective when you've got a truck with that much com computer power. That's 2012. Where are we at today? 80 to 90 percent of the programming needed to manage this massive amount of data and make decision making on our behalf are two. What about the design? Many of you have heard of the DARPA challenge, and a little side note, by the way, because this is very similar to the story of auto insurance back at the turn of the century. The roots of autonomous vehicles are not on the West Coast, not Silicon Valley, not in the special effects areas of Hollywood, not in the financial center on the East Coast, but the Midwest, Illinois, Iowa, Wisconsin. Caterpillar has needed fully autonomous vehicles that can operate without GPS to operate a mile or two on the ground since the mid-90s. John Deere pioneered autonomy and laser sight and radar operation, radar operated vehicles um, in agriculture. Well, here's a vehicle from the Dark Challenge. Again, not exactly something you're going to go buy off the showroom floor. Four years later, that's a picture of our Kia Soul. You can see the technology is far more integrated into the design. Fast forward only one year, and you have the Lincoln Continental. And again, that's one of our cars. Now, I'm showing you these three vehicles to make a point. All of them were retrofitted. They didn't come off the assembly line this way. In fact, the vehicle that you're going to take a demonstration ride in later today, for those of you that have signed up, was retrofitted here on site just in the past two days. And you'll see the technology is largely fully integrated into the design of the vehicle. Where is it headed? Well, meet Robo Racer. This is an indie scale, high speed track race car. Part of a new racing circuit being launched largely by the video. And this is a fully autonomous, not remote controlled vehicle. 186 miles an hour, around the track. And you start to see how you can affect the design, the materials. Now, there's no room for a passenger here, not exactly something you're going to go by, but look where it's headed. There's an, another aspect of, about these technologies that you need to keep in mind. It's called the network effect. And this, you don't get this with a seatbelt, and you don't get this with an airbag. These cars can see 10 times the distance of human sight without distraction and without fatigue. And so what that means for us is that they can see and act on our behalf ahead of our capabilities. Now, what that also means is one vehicle surrounded by four or five vehicles makes all of those vehicles safer if the one in the middle has these technologies. In other words, according to the Texas Transportation Research Institute, we can result or an output from a 24% deployment could be an 80 to 85% reduction in crashes. Now, that's an interesting statistic by itself, and intuitively it makes sense. Think about what I just said a few minutes ago, that all of the vehicles in this presentation and the vehicles you saw in that slide were done in a retrofit, not off the assembly line. And you'll see that the, all of the Pundman's predictions about the length of time for deployment or adoption or what have you, and I understand there's questions about consumer confidence, but this is not about turning over the fleet. So 
So you see on the, on the left, your right, that the vehicles have, are, the front of the vehicle is impacted 61% of the time in crashes. And this is a statistic you're all familiar with. Here's what's unprecedented. Things like FCW, forward collision warning, adaptive headlights, automatic cruise control, automatic braking, are essentially causing a double digit simultaneous decline in both frequency and severity. Never before in the history of insurance, particularly auto insurance, have you seen both decline and both decline in double digits. The bodily injury severity from adaptive headlights by themselves, and this is just in the few vehicles uh, out on the road today that have it, is a decline of 28%. Now, this is significant because these are technologies that have been sold in the marketplace for the past five, six, seven years. This isn't even going full time. When we want to talk about seeing ahead of us, or taking this, and if you will, essentially putting it on steroids, what does that actually mean? Let's take a look. So here you see one of our vehicles and what the car sees. And you see the high resolution mapping as it's going. All of these red dots are objects that have been coded, and pretty soon you're going to see the car pull up behind some other moving vehicles. Now this is recorded in real time. And I show you this for a couple of reasons. One, I'll tell you in a second where this is going from a development perspective, but from a second, there's not going to be any question about knowing what went wrong or who to blame or what could have gone better or different from what you're going to see. Um, you have real-time 360-degree event reconstruction. Now, I said I'm going to talk about where we're going. All of the objects that are in this particular video were programmed in. So the car drove around, the data was recorded, each object, be it stationary or a variable or mobile, has been coded in by somebody. What we're using now is called deep learning. And so we will drive a vehicle, collect the data as the vehicle is driven. The car is actually, it is a true artificial intelligent machine learning in that the car is learning to drive like we drive. So not only is it picking up these objects faster and self-coding, self-identifying, but it is learning more effectively about keeping up with traffic as opposed to speed limits, and it's going to vastly accelerate. And essentially autonomy becomes, or the software for autonomy becomes like an operating system. You hear people talk about Android or iOS. Well, this is autonomy. What you're seeing here is the advent of autonomy as an operating system that you can, again, start to just add stuff to, like apps. Which leads to the second question. And this is largely a US question. How good is good enough? Now I've talked about cars being the killer of young adults more than any or all forms of cancer combined. If these technologies can prevent 85% of our accidents, 85% of our fatalities, my question is, doesn't that kind of sound like a vaccine? If a pharmaceutical company had a vaccine for cancer but did not go to market because it was only 80% effective, 85% effective, 90% effective, what would be the outcry? What would happen to the stock price? How would the regulators handle it? But with cars, because we're going to hold the machines to a much higher standard than we hold ourselves in the U.S., we tend to focus more about the 5, 10, 15 percent that we can't prevent. And as a result, we could very well find ourselves being the country that invents but doesn't deploy for the benefit of society.
for our deployment will lag behind and is lagging behind other parts of the world. Is that right? Are we stuck in this? Are we going to continue to be stuck in this chicken and egg debate about? Well, we'll support it once we know what the laws are. Well, we'll know what the laws are once we know how effective the technology can be. Well, we'll design the technology once we know what the laws are. We end up in this circular argument. Now, you have companies like Tesla, Google, and others that are saying, you know what, we're just going to do it. And hopefully that's an approach that works. A lot of pundits would say that consumers aren't quite ready. I disagree. Once you eliminate 85, 80% of the accidents, once you introduce autonomy, now you can start to design vehicles specifically for their end use. What you see here is essentially a result of the explosion in do-it-yourself stuff. This is a Phoenix-based company. It's called Local Motors. It's a company I'm very familiar with. The manufacturing process is a 3D printer. This car is largely manufactured on a 3D printer. The design is fully electric, fully autonomous, potentially under 25,000, and more importantly, consumers can submit designs and weigh in, get feedback from other designers. Once you land on a final design that's feasible, the car could be manufactured in a couple of weeks. Communities are competing to have one of these small manufacturing facilities in, the, in you know, located with them, and for good reason. This is the next generation of vehicle manufacturing. Is the insurance industry ready for the repairability aspects of a low-speed electric vehicle, <coughs> excuse me, such as this? I would submit to you or not. We're still thinking about bumpers and fenders. This is modular bodies transparent solar recharging. This particular vehicle is wirelessly recharged through inductive. What about the recycling? What about end of life? But again, once you introduce autonomy, once you eliminate a certain percentage of the accidents, what you have is a watershed. In this case, that watershed plays out in the electrification, design, and materials all at once. Now, I don't know about you, but I've always been a skeptic when I hear Amazon talking about using drones to deliver packages. I mean, are we really just going to black out the sky with thousands and thousands of drones humming over our heads to drop packages? I'm sure there's a way to do it that I just haven't seen. I find this far more likely. Now, if I started with this, vehicle that you see here, designed for FedEx by IDEO, fully robotic, fully autonomous, obviously no human in it. You have to be willing to go out and get your own package. But for some reason, this just seems a whole lot more viable. Again, you start to design the vehicle for its use. Now, with this greater degree of mobility and this greater degree of data capture, you're going to have a greater degree of privacy issues. And those are real. Here you have people moving in real time throughout the city of San Francisco. Pretty soon you start to map because you can pull data without acquiring it, just free. Pull data from social media, conversations, and find out who's connecting with who and why. And start mapping out those uses and start designing for the end state. Why are they connecting? Who's connecting? Who is sharing information? and then remap that back onto the city, and fundamentally, you've redesigned what the real traffic pattern is, not what the historic traffic pattern is, and you can start to have vehicles to meet those needs. Now, we talked about um, designing for specific applications. Let me show you one more example. This is our robotics. This is a company of five from India that are now operating on the West Coast. And the idea here is to have uh, a vehicle that will essentially operate on sidewalks. 
know why would you want to operate a vehicle on a sidewalk? Maybe you have students that are injured or disabled. So here we have, uh, I for the here we have uh, myself and the CEO of the vehicle, and it successfully avoiding this. Campuses are going to contract with this as mobility as a service and be able to move people from point A to point B that are injured or disabled or have diminished capacity. Maybe you want a rolling office, or if you pull the driver and all the controls out of the front seat, you can have a much more spacious limousine as displayed here by Bentley. Which leads to the third question, who will lead? And this gets back to this American question. Now, let's talk about the consumer job to be done, for example. Here you have a fully autonomous bus. In use, Singapore. And obviously, these consumers have no hesitation about trusting the technology. Now, that's a lot of rolling steel. But this is a fully, fully autonomous, fully operational bus. And if you look pretty carefully, you can tell there is nobody in the front. That's where their deployment's at. We're experimenting with buses in Washington, and I'll talk more about that in a minute, uh, for safety. In the US, our consumers are essentially an hourglass laying on its side. 40% of the population is under 40, and they only own 10% of the household assets. 45% of the population is over 55, and they own 70% of the household assets, but they took a huge economic hit in 2008, 2012. What do they share in common? Debt, trillion dollars. The younger generation cares far more about flexibility. They are driving this urbanization movement. Their identity is not identified by the vehicle that they own and they are much more interested in mobility as a service. Uber without a driver. The older demographic group has a need for independent mobility regardless of their mental or physical capacity and they have the money to be early adopters. And more importantly, since the advent of the smartphone, when everybody became a technologist by carrying a supercomputer around in their pocket, much more trusting of technology. We have to think about our mobility system being busted on a global scale, not just a Western or US scale. So in India, you've got 200,000 people a week migrating from rural India to urban India. In China, roughly 300 million people will make the migration from rural to urban. Now, China is at 85 cars per 1,000 people. The US is at 840. Let me put this in perspective. If China does not increase beyond 85 cars per thousand with that kind of migration, Beijing alone will need a parking garage roughly the same square footage as the state of Pennsylvania. You start to see pretty soon this is silly, this just isn't viable. And so thus I can submit to you this shift away from low occupancy, personally owned, low use, Gas powered is a busted system, and the time for change is now, and it is an inevitable shift. If we need another data point, let's look at air quality. At 85 cars per 1,000 people, on a bad day, the air quality in Beijing is 300 or 200 times worse than what the World Health Organization considers safe. In New Delhi, at 35 cars per 1,000 people, you have the same air quality issues. So let's wrap up by talking about what can be an insurer's first steps to embrace these disruptive technologies. And our focus today has been on cars. I assure you, the insurance industry is under assault from 360 degrees of transformational technology, be that mobility, medicine, genome, it's regulatory. It's unprecedented 
in the history of industrialized corporations or the history of corporations in modern times. This is an unprecedented level of disruption that's hitting the insurance industry all at once. So what can be an insurer's first steps? First, embrace innovation. Now, what does that mean? Innovation is not boil the ocean, it's not blue sky, it's not throwing money down a rabbit hole. Let's be really clear about this. Because in my full-time day job, this is what I do. I'm an innovation architect and coach. Most of my clients are insurers. Innovation is defined as creating new products, new services, even new markets, even new industries. And make no mistake about it, at the core, the insurance industry enables markets, industries, and economies. So there's no reason to believe for a second that innovation should not include innovation at that scale or creativity at that scale. Take a systematic approach and always keep your eye on the ball. Adopt an innovation practice as a growth engine, not as an R&D. Obviously, for reasons of non-disclosure agreement, among other things, I can't name my clients. But I will tell you that over the past four years, the net ROI among all of those companies combined is over $220 million. A systematic approach driven by constraints and driven by commitment will, the net result will be growth. Number two, collaborate, and I'll make this point again, look at places and pockets around the country where these technologies are being embraced. Now Babcock Ranch is down my neck of the woods in Florida. It's a brand new plan development community. Huge, enormous community. And more importantly, it's going to operate on a transportation system of fully autonomous electric vehicles. Now, will people be able to own their own cars? Sure, and there'll be a parking garage outside the city limits. This is a throwback to Rome when Caesar said all of the carts have to be out of the city limits by sunrise. You can't bring them back in until sunset. You'll have a fully autonomous electric vehicle to take you to your car, but for getting around the city, getting around the community, there'll be a system of shared electric autonomous vehicles. So it's mobility as a service. Embrace that disruption is inevitable, and you are far better off realizing that you have to disrupt yourself from within first before being disrupted by people who care far less about your individual or corporate success. Now, I understand some of these messages are messing with your legacy, and some of you may be sitting there looking at your watches going, I hope I can just write this out and it'll be the next guy's problem. <coughs> Excuse me. I would encourage you to walk up to the most important question any insurer can ask themselves today. And it's not how do we hold on, it's what if. And then however you want to finish that question, you should explore. It is one of the most frightening questions to ask because once you know, you can't unknow. But the most important question you can go back and ask is what if. And finally, understand that this is happening. The U.S. just committed another $4 billion to accelerating autonomy in the vehicles. When the states couldn't decide if the driver in a box actually qualifies as a safe driver, the feds immediately stepped in and said, for the purposes of safety and insurance and regulation, we consider the computer a driver. Collaborate. Now I talked about experimenting with buses in Washington, and that is a collaboration between a reinsurer and oh, the insurance transit, the insurance pool for that transit agency. And I will tell you, this is a very low-level degree of technology that's being retrofitted in this experimentation, but in the first 30 days, on only four buses, two fatalities were prevented. Two pedestrians were not included in a fatality count because of the retrofit of a, the minimal degree of technology. Not even talking about autonomy yet, this was just driver warning. 
here you have, and this is a picture of one of the buses. With autonomy, we get a whole new level of democratizing mobility. Now, that means fighting an enormous status quo because the auto industry has essentially been on a cycle of incremental improvement and incremental innovation for over 100 years, along with huge industries. So, we have this great transformation. We're at the precipice, but we have to remember transformation is messy. I talked about a watershed moment in 2009, so let me describe it for you. At that time, I was director of foresight and innovation with a very large auto insurance company. And I thought I had a pretty good handle because in 2007, I started to really focus on vehicle technology, the development path, and shared mobility, and all of the mobility disruption that could impact an insurer. And I was home one night, I was doing some research, and my son, who's 6'4", comes running downstairs with his laptop, drops his laptop in front of me, and he says, Dad, you got to watch this. And what I had in front of me were the very first New York Times videos of Google self-driving cars at that time, again, 2009. And instantly, I'm kind of busy because I realized the handle I thought I had on all this just a guy. It's just blown up. And my son looked at me and he said, what do you think? And of course, I was already working, and so my head was about work. I really wasn't sure what to say to him, and so I looked up and I said, I don't know, Patrick, what do you think? I just kind of threw up my hand. And he looked at me, and I'll never forget this answer. He said, Dad, it means I get taught a car someday. So, you have to understand, Patrick is Autistic. Now, very functional, but not to be, not to the point of driving a car, not without a car that could help him. And I went, oh my god, it hit me like a sledge. I mean, I felt like I'd literally just kind of been hit slapped. And in a very, but in a good way, I was moved by what he had to say. So I started doing research, and it turns out, 15% of all the U.S. adult households follow Patrick's circumstances. What happens when you take 15% of the current adult household count and take them from being dependent on social welfare systems and enable independence? For many people, these technologies represent hope, independence, productivity and a new market for you all, for those who embrace, for those who decide to lead. That's it for my prepared comments. I know we're going to go into a Q&A. Uh, I'm going to show you a quick video, uh, which is a precursor to the demonstration ride you'll have uh, coming up. And then we'll be ready to roll. Thank you very much. And after the video, again, I'll come back up for the Q&A. Appreciate it.